This is CBC Here and Now. ACER today charged Councilor Joe Smythe with obstruction of justice in relation to issuing a ticket for a traffic offense that did not occur. Tonight, officer charged. Joe Smythe, the RNC officer who shot and killed Don Dunphy, arrested and charged in relation to another incident. And because of Chris's past or because of things that he'd done, his mental health wasn't taken serious. He was, he was ignored. From police standoffs to standing up for his fellow prisoners. This inmate says prison staff could have prevented his friend's death. Good evening, I'm Arianna Kellen. And I'm Debbie Cooper. And we start tonight with a story that's been developing all afternoon. The officer who shot and killed Don Dunphy is now facing a criminal charge. But it's not connected to that incident three years ago. Joe Smythe was booked today after an outside investigation into a traffic stop last spring. Here now's Ryan Cook's been looking into this. He is live tonight in our newsroom. Ryan? Well, Debbie, it's quite a serious allegation that Constable Joe Smythe pulled over a vehicle and issued a ticket for a violation when no violation occurred. And other than that, we don't know very much about the incident, but RNC Chief Joe Boland did say that he will not stand for bad police work. I want to assure the public that misconduct by any RNC police officer is not acceptable and will not be tolerated within this province or within this police service. I will continue to hold any officer who does not represent our values accountable for their actions. Now we know that the first complaint came from the province's Crown Attorney's Office and it was then passed off to the Alberta Serious Incidents Response Team or ACERT and from there an external investigation was launched. We also know that this is not the first time that Joe Smythe has been investigated. There was a judicial inquiry after Don Dunphy was fatally shot which concluded that Smythe used necessary force but raised questions about his conduct. There were also several previous incidents where he used force, including one where he struck a deaf man for not complying with his orders. Now, Ryan, you sm spoke to Smythe's lawyer this afternoon. What is Jerome Kennedy saying? Well, he says that Constable Smythe is disappointed that a charge was laid, but that they're both confident that he'll be found not guilty of this. I also asked Jerome Kennedy about the stigma around Joe Smythe in the wake of Don Dunphy's death. The presumption of innocence is one of the most basic principles in our criminal justice system, but the reality is that once, once someone is charged, uh, the people presume that the person charged is guilty. So what's happened with, uh, with Constable Smythe is that there's uh, the residual effect of the, of the inquiry, and uh, I, I believe that uh, the fact of uh, who he is, is certainly uh, uh, plays into uh, what's going on here. Now it's important to note that there are actually two complaints lodged about this one incident. The first is the criminal complaint that we mentioned, but there's also a public complaint lodged by the driver of the vehicle. So that means that even if Joe Smythe is found not guilty in a court of law, the RNC will still be launching its own internal investigation. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Ryan Cook. It's been more than a week since inmate Chris Sutton was found dead in his cell at Her Majesty's Penitentiary. Sutton's friends inside the prison say guards could have changed the course of what happened that day. Here now is Malone Mullen has been speaking to those who knew him and she's joining us live outside HMP. Malone? I was inside the pen yesterday speaking to inmates. They told me Sutton had been laughed at and strip searched by guards when he asked them for help and his threats of suicide it were ignored the day he died. It started like any other day inside Her Majesty's Penitentiary. Inmates woke up, had breakfast, and were locked in their cells by lunchtime. We were locked down from was supposed to be 12 o'clock to 2 o'clock. Inmate Chad Ralph was in the cell block that day, the day his friend, another inmate, took his life. He says Chris Sutton spoke to a guard before they left the inmates alone asking to be put on suicide watch. She looked at him, she said, are you suicidal? And he said, you'll see. He never said yes. He said, you'll see. And when she was walking away, he was singing, I'm gonna hang myself. She never took him serious. And when she come back, she was the one that had to perform CPR for 20 minutes on him. Word traveled fast. Inmate and friend of Sutton's, Justin Wiseman, said the news wasn't surprising. The cops were trying to kill me. They're trying to kill me. Wiseman, like Sutton, has been in and out of prison for years. He once asked police to shoot him during a standoff and held a shotgun to his mouth. 
Five years ago, I was in an armed standoff where I said I was going to take my life. I get out of prison. I'm in a standoff where I say I'm going to take my life. Why do things keep, why does the cycle keep going? You know what I mean? Like there's, the cycle can't end unless there's a systematic change that starts here. Wiseman says he also attempted to hang himself in prison three years ago, but a guard's attention saved him. Lucky I had guards there that day that acted quickly and saved me. But on Chris's part, even after screaming this out for weeks at a time, he still couldn't be saved. You know, it just doesn't make no sense. The Justice Department said today they're working on checking on inmates more regularly. Right now, round-the-clock surveillance only happens here, in segregation. Wiseman has been in here before and thinks, in the long run, it does more harm than good. But if I tell them I'm suicidal, I get taken from my cell, I get brought down to the hole, and I get stuck in a hole with a dress and a blanket that's too uncomfortable to put around you, and the cell stinks of feces and urine, and all you can think about while you're in that cell is how I gotta lie to them to get back out of this cell because it's, it, it sucks and it just makes you wanna kill yourself even more. So when you go to see the doctor, you tell him anything he wants to hear just to get up out of the hole. Both inmates described a lack of recreation, courses and things to do. That means lots of idle time inside the prison walls with no fresh air. And when they're desperate for help, there's nowhere to turn. Sutton laid all this out in a letter days before he died, alone in his cell. This needs to be for, for, any, for anyone and everyone. There's, there's, there's this cookie cutter home right now that's probably gonna watch this and say, and, and probably judge me for who I am and what I've done, but their kid that's in college can make a mistake one day, maybe get drunk with friends, accidentally run someone over, and then they're in here, you know what I mean? And then they don't know where to go, they don't know who to turn to, and next thing you know, they're dead in prison. It can happen to anybody. Thanks, Malone. That's Malone Mullen reporting live this evening from Her Majesty's Penitentiary. Now to react to this story and to answer some questions, we have Justice Minister Andrew Parsons in studio. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me on. Um, you just watched that piece and heard that piece. Um, what do you think about what those two men had to say? Well, I, I think the first thing you have to note is, is I don't imagine it's been done very often where we're actually allowing interactions like this within the institutions. I, I think it's important that people have an opportunity to speak out. Uh, I can't imagine media have been allowed inside to do stuff like that before. It just shows that we are, we're trying to be open, we're trying to be accountable. Uh, I can't speak about the investigation or the allegations that are being made there, but what I'm not going to do is certainly uh, throw any of our correction officers under a bus, I can guarantee you that. Uh, the facts of this will come out. That's why we're having an independent investigation done uh, into the situation at HMP. We'd like to know what happened. So again, it's hard to respond in many ways because it's just, it's just not appropriate for me to do so. Uh, you know, I, I hear some of these complaints. I mean, I've talked to inmates and we talk about mental health and addictions, but there's also safety concerns uh, within any institution, and this is the norm across Canada. So you know, I, I think there's room uh, to grow. I think there's room to change, uh, but again, we have institutions here where you know safety is a priority as well. Now, leading up to this, I mean, four deaths in 11 months. Um, the citizens' representative says that they reached out to the Justice Department a year ago with concerns over mentally ill inmates, segregation. Uh, were those concerns not listened to? then? Well, no, obviously that's not the case. I mean, it was just back in the fall that we introduced the, some of the most progressive policy as it relates to segregation. Uh, we've done that, and in fact, it's, it's uh, more progressive than you see in many other provinces. Obviously, we hear that. Now, when it comes to the citizens representative, this is not, uh, you know, this is not unusual. I mean, you look at their report any year over the last decade, and you'll see that the, the number of complaints that come from Her Majesty's is more than every other part of the province combined. That's a normal aspect. And it's no different than in human rights. This is this they hear from this population quite regularly. And obviously I don't ignore what they have to say. Uh, we've made change when it comes to segregation policy and we're working to make change as it relates to incarceration and relates to prisons in our province. But this is not an unusual issue, it's something we deal with uh, in every province, in right. every institution. But people are dying in this case, four people in a year. So you do have an independent inquiry yeah. uh, that's underway or review. Investigation, um, yeah. Do you think that that's enough, given the fact that since Marlene Gesso started her review, another yeah. person has died? Well, I mean, this speaks to, this is not just a prison issue. 
this is an issue within our society. It's hard to turn on the news any day and not see the loss of, you know, of someone, someone that's chosen to take their own life. And, and th these are tragedies that we are facing every single day. And, and so when you look at an institution where we have a number of people that are incarcerated for committing crimes, and many of them do face challenges with, with addictions, and they do face challenges with mental health, we are, I think, taking actions that will see a change. Just, we have the independent review that will come in and talk about these specifics, and we're open to listening to any recommendations that come forward. That, but that doesn't mean that we're not uh, making change, uh, you know, independent of that or going on the side of that. I mean, one thing that we're, we're doing actually is increasing our addictions counselors within the institution. Uh, we've had one there, and I mean, that's a, that's a long caseload uh, for, you know, for a number of people. So we're actually going to increase that. One of the big things you will see, and, and people don't see this. You know, I mean, inmates don't see this. Many times staff don't see this. But, you know, we've been working with the Department of Health for over a year on changing the delivery of health care within our institutions. But, again, it comes with a number of challenges. It's not as easy as people would like to, to portray it, and it, we face challenges. I want to ask you one more question yep. while you're here. Uh, just in the news, Royal Newfoundland Constabulary Officer Joe Smythe uh, charged that came out of an ACERT uh, investigation. Where's the province right now on track for its own uh, CERT? Well, we're still moving forward with the plan that we've laid out. We had promised legislation in the fall, which we did uh, have you know, proclaimed in the House. We've got that part done. Now we move forward with the model. Uh, we had still hadn't made a decision about standalone or doing an Atlantic model, but the way I, I look at things, I, I'm not sure if the Atlantic model is the one that's uh, going to work out for us. Uh, I'd like to see someone, and we're working towards having someone hired here in this province to be that civilian oversight, uh, but I would also say that we've got a really good relationship with Alberta, the ACERT team. I mean, again, you saw uh, the results of our cooperation and collaboration with them, so I'd like to think that we're still going to explore a possibility of partnering with Alberta as well. That's something that uh, we've been working on so we're still moving forward there's a lot of moving parts to that but the good thing to see is that right now as it stands we do have independent oversight in this province okay thanks minister thank you debbie thank you ariana well one of the inmates who spoke out today was in court today justin wiseman pleaded not guilty to several charges including robbery wiseman is accused of robbing a gas station liquor store and a convenience store in march before holding up in a mount pearl home a standoff followed and he was eventually taken away by police and paramedics but not before allegedly setting fire to the home a list of other charges including assault and arson were set aside until later this month it wasn't wiseman's first standoff in 2013 he barricaded himself inside a home on Springdale Street for nine hours. Well, new artwork on display, a place to grab a beer. St. John's Airport unveils its new makeover. Just ahead, we'll take you inside for a closer look. Well, protesters crashed a government announcement today in Springdale. They want Central Health to give hospital privileges back to a family doctor. They took their passion right to the head of Central Health. Here now is Garrett Barry was there. Keep Dr. Young! Keep Dr. Young! Keep Dr. Young! Signs and chanting for Dr. Todd Young. Give him privileges! He's battled with the health authority for years. Now, Young says it's too hard to keep his private practice if he can't see his patients when they're in hospital. So he's shutting down. I had a bone in my lung for two years. He found it. So I can thank him for me standing here talking to you right now. So why shouldn't I fight for to have Dr. Young see me right now? This is our taxpayer dollars that we're paying here. All right, to support this hospital and to support our doctors. And if we have them here, why are we sending them away? He's right from our own hometown and he has agreed to stay here. These chants drowned out the announcement inside. Based care services embedded, no doubt. Then they took their argument upstairs. Uh, Dr. Hagee said he can't do anything. Okay, so who represents? He's the Minister of Health. Central Health told them the story isn't over yet and no final decision has been made. Reality is, is that there is a process and we will go through that process. So it is, it is time, it is a matter of time that, that will play out in the next little while. We need all of the information that's required as part of the medical staff bylaws to review the application in its, complete, in its entirety. Today's announcement was about a new hospital. 
Government says in about 20 months a new Green Bay Health Center will be built, but that's not what Health Minister John Hangy ended up discussing. We heard very clearly the concerns about primary care in, in the Springdale area in relation to Dr. Young and his request for privileges. Um, the, the facts of the case are is uh, that uh, admitting privileges for any physician are determined by a group of peer physicians within the region uh, called a credentialing committee. They unveiled the new look for Springdale's hospital, but decision makers here answered more questions about who's going to work inside. Garrett Berry, CBC News, Springdale. Well, students and faculty kicked off Pride Week on campus today at Memorial University in St. John's. The next week will be packed with events, everything from a movie night to a self-defense workshop to the Pride Parade. Dr. Ian Sutherland, Dean of the School of M Music, spoke on behalf of the university and he referenced the important role the university community played in his life when he was a student there. Perfectly frank, I was lucky. In 1998, almost exactly 20 years ago to the day, I entered Memorial University, in particular the School of Music and the Bachelor of Music program. And just about a year later, I came out as a young gay man. I say I was lucky because the School of Music at that time, and perhaps even more so today, was an incredibly understanding, supportive, respectful, and inclusive community. I certainly remember that time as being a time of fear, trepidation, perhaps terror at times, a lot of anxiety. But today I remember it more as a time of relief and experiencing of love as my friends, my colleagues, my faculty members and my staff of the School of Music accepted me for who I was. Well, Carolyn, yes. I want to ask, <laughs> am I going to need rain gear? But I think it's more like, will it help even if I have? You will point. definitely need rain gear tomorrow, especially if you are west of the Avalon, because that's where the real rain is going to come down. But you can leave your umbrella at home because, you know, that's not going to work <laughs> in the no, wind. Ever. <laughs> so, yes, we are keeping a close eye on Hurricane Chris. So let's get right to it and have a look at where Chris is right now. This is our satellite and radar shot. Uh, you can see a few showers going across the island tonight. And there is the light. Here we go. And this is Hurricane Chris. Right now he is a category two hurricane off the coast of uh, the US, not really causing much trouble for anyone right now. But by the time tomorrow morning comes, it'll be just south of Nova Scotia. And you can see that it's losing strength as it heads towards the island. And by the time it hits the southeastern portion of the island, it's expected to be a post tropical storm. But we still have a lot of weather associated with that. And this is what we can expect tomorrow. We have a rainfall warning in effect for the Canegra over through uh, Terra Nova, down the Buren Peninsula, Bonavista. So if you're in those areas, you can expect 40 to 70 millimeters of rain. We have a wind warning in effect for the southeastern portion of the Avalon, gusts up to 100. And you can see here that uh, there's a special weather statement in effect for St. John's. So won't be getting quite as much rain or quite as much wind, but it's still going to be a stormy day. You can see the rain tomorrow morning is going to start around 11 a.m. along the south coast and continue and intensify throughout the day. Here we are at 6 o'clock tomorrow. Lots of rain there in central areas and then continuing into Thursday night. That's when the wind is really going to pick up strength in the east. I'll have details about that and uh, rainfall amounts coming up later. Ariana. Well, a woman could be facing a hefty fine after allegedly being unruly on an Air Canada flight from Toronto to Amsterdam. The plane was diverted to Goose Bay Airport early Saturday morning and a 21 year old woman was taken into custody. Elk Van de Voort is scheduled to appear in court tomorrow morning for a bail hearing. The RCMP says she is facing one charge of mischief over $5,000 and two charges under the Aeronautics Act. CBC spoke with one woman aboard the flight who said the detour took about an hour and a half. A deal to sell the Kumbai Chance refinery has fallen through. That's according to the news agency Reuters. For the past year, Neil Shear and Kashik Amen were in talks to sell the North Atlantic refinery with Irving Oil as the leading bidder. But the parties couldn't agree on a selling price. One wanted it to go for $250 million, the other 
400 million. According to Reuters, there are now no plans on the table to sell the refinery. Neither Irving nor the refinery responded to requests for comment. Well, after this fire damaged some homes and could have destroyed the Camount Terrace neighborhood, the St. John's Fire Department is reminding you that open air fires are banned. There is a fire advisory in effect because of the warm temperatures and dry, windy conditions. However, fires in contained devices like chimeneas and barrels are allowed as long as you follow the rules, like keeping the fire contained and having a water hose or fire extinguisher nearby. But you can always contact the fire department if you have any questions. New rules are in place to prevent boats from getting too close to whales. They came into effect today. As here now's Peter Cowan reports, anyone breaking the rules could get a big fine. Whales are a big draw for tourists here in Newfoundland and Labrador, and everyone wants to get up close to them. But for the tourists heading out for whale watching trips today, they're not going to be able to get quite as close as they could just yesterday. New rules are now in effect. The closest boats can get to whales here in this province is 100 meters. It was a guideline before, but now it's backed up by some serious fines of $100,000 if you get too close. On the west coast of the country, the rules are even more strict. You have to stay 200 meters away from killer whales because of the endangered populations there. Some tour operators there have objected to these new rules, but operators I'm talking to here in Bay Bulls say they've been following these as guidelines for years. They're actually happy that there are more restrictive rules because it'll mean DFO is able to crack down on recreational boaters who are getting too close. The, the local people that go and want to go do a selfie on a sea do or something, they shouldn't stay around these whales. They should view them from the distance and learn about respect for these animals. And the regulation will be enforced that if they continue to operate in a, in a non-professional fashion around whales, that someone will be prosecuted by fisheries and oceans. Harassing whales has always been against the rules. And in fact, our cameras captured this encounter in 2014 that led to charges against one tour boat operator. Those charges are still making their way through court. But DFO is now laying out specific do's and don'ts when it comes to whales. For example, you're now not allowed to swim with whales, which could be trouble for one tour operator that's offering that as a package. You're also not allowed to disturb them when they're feeding or wake them up when they're sleeping. In the short term, DFO says they're not going to be looking to lay big fines. Instead, they're going to be focusing on educating people about the new rules. Peter Cowan, CBC News, Bay Bulls. Well, and one of the questions, Arianna, a lot of people are asking is, what happens if the whales come to you? Yeah, not my fault. <laughs> well, we asked DFO officials today, and they said that their focus is on people who try to get too close, but they do recommend that you try and safely keep your distance. Well, it's like an episode of extreme makeover today at the St. John's Airport. The airport authority unveiled phase one of a renovation aimed at providing more services to travelers. Here now is Megan Kwan reports. After four years of planning and construction, the first phase of the St. John's International Airport expansion is finally complete, on budget and on time. And today was the big reveal. Sleek, swanky and much, much bigger. The new departures area is solving a lot of problems. So this expansion is one that was overdue. We had to add capacity, we had to uh, 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 improve the ability to deal with all these security issues. Uh, and so we're just ecstatic. Passengers can expect to fly through security with four times the screening space before making their way to the lounge area where they'll see a few familiar names like Newfoundland Chocolate Company and Booster Juice. And for the airport's first full-service restaurant inside security, St. John's very own Yellow Belly Brewery. They're hoping this expansion will help their business take off. We're in the process of uh, looking to build a bigger brewery to eventually be able to uh, distribute to the rest of Canada. And I think this is the, uh, the gateway for us, to, uh, so to speak. Even families with little ones can get on board with the $72.7 million expansion. Children have their own designated play area and parents have their own space for nursing. This first phase also features things like triple the amount of seating with charging stations and three new boarding gates for aircrafts. A second phase that will focus on the arrivals area is set to begin in 2019. Megan Kwan, CBC News, St. John's. 
A new concert series is set to kick off on George Street tonight, one that's encouraging people of all ages to come down and enjoy the street. I'm Jeremy Eaton. As you can see, I'm live down here, and I'll have more details coming up after the break. Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, something new is brewing on George Street. A summer concert series launches tonight with the aim of opening up the infamous Party Street to an all-ages, family-friendly audience. Here and Now's Jeremy Eaton is on George Street in St. John's. Well, Jeremy, even this is a little early for you. What's going on downtown? <laughs> Well, it's uh, George Street is arguably the most famous bar street with more pubs and clubs per capita than any other street in North America. But sometimes it gets a little bit of a bad rap, but work is underway to try to clean up its image. And tonight, a new summer concert series kicks off to do that. And to tell us more about it is the executive director of the George Street Association, Jonathan Galgay. Jonathan, thank you for joining us. Thanks for being here tonight. Tell us what's going to happen on the stage behind you. Well, beginning at 7 o'clock tonight till 9 o'clock, we're going to have live entertainment for all ages. This concert series will run right up until the end of August, with the exception of July the 25th and August the 1st, to allow us to prepare for our annual festival. Corby Spirits and Coors Light are supporters of this event throughout the summer, so we're extremely pleased to have their support. But this is about building a stronger relationship with the community 
George Street itself has a diverse number of bars and restaurants and the lineup that you're going to see over the next couple of weeks is all going to be about diversity and showcasing the talent and uh, the incredible musicians uh, that are throughout our province so we're really pumped about it. Now unlike other events this isn't limited to 19 and over why would uh, the association want to put off an all ages concert series right. here on the street? This is the premier entertainment district in Newfoundland and Labrador and many restaurants are open to all ages uh, during certain hours throughout the day and we have a natural amphitheater we have a stage we have the support of the city so what a great way to give back to community with our sponsors and our supporters to allow for you know a diversification and allowing all ages to come in and experience music and entertainment that typically they wouldn't get to see because it's always been restricted to 19 plus. And uh, we only got a few quick seconds left, but can you tell us who's going to be on the stage tonight? Right, we have uh, Carolina East is going to be here tonight. She's going to kick things off, and uh, we're really, really excited about that. So it's, it's going to be great. Now, is this something we could see extend into the future? It is. We are already in discussions to determine how successful this event is this year. We'll evaluate it and come back to our board members. Uh, but we're really excited, and we're starting to hear from people that are really excited. And uh, stay tuned. Appreciate your time. Thanks so much, Jonathan Galgay. And I'll be back later on with more on the George Street Summer Concert Series later on in the show. Reporting live from here and now, I'm Jeremy Eaton in St. John's. Looking to downsize or perhaps get a starter home? Here's one option. Tiny homes are becoming a thing in many places. But one young couple's plans have been put on hold while the town of Pooch Cove ponders the potential.
Software Update is brought to you by Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 570 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can, too. A lot of weather to get to, but Carolyn, first of all, we're going to let everybody see the Capelin that were rolling in Whitless Bay last night. This video is from Brad Ball. Look at that. Yeah, wow. it's amazing. And he told us in an email that the Capelin were in Lower Pond in Whitless Bay. If you're looking to see where that was, haven't seen any reports of the fish in Middle Cove yet, though. Mm -hmm. Well, you'll probably want to avoid the shoreline tomorrow afternoon, considering there is a post-tropical storm on the way. Environment Canada is warning about storm surges tomorrow, so it's definitely something to be wary of tomorrow. So let's get right to it. Starting with tonight, we do have some scattered showers on the way for mostly everyone in the province. Nothing major at all, but uh, it's still there. You could see a little bit of wet weather overnight tonight. This is the picture this evening. Chance of showers pretty much right across the board. Uh, southwesterly winds in the east, 40 to 60, so a little bit breezy, but other than that, a very quiet night ahead of Chris. Yes, he's now a, a Category 2 hurricane heading our way tomorrow afternoon ahead of this storm. Uh, the hurricane turning into a post-tropical storm. We are expecting uh, some rain and lots of it, especially if you are in the Conegra area up through Terra Nova, Bonavista, down the Buren Peninsula. Lots of rain heading your way. We do have that wind warning in effect for the southeastern portion of the Avalon gusts up to 100 kilometers an hour there and a special weather statement for St. John's. So it won't be quite as bad in the St. John's area, but it's still going to be a very wet, uh, windy day. So tomorrow morning, the showers will start along the south coast and Throughout the day, it will intensify. You can see the yellow here. These are the heavier showers, heaviest you can see along the south coast, moving up uh, towards the Bonavista area and Terra Nova throughout the day. Here's a tighter look at uh, what we can expect tomorrow morning. Coming up through St. John's area at the Avalon by 1 o'clock, we'll be into some fairly heavy showers as well up in the, uh, the Bonavista area. And uh, throughout the day, you can see Marystown, the Buren getting those heavier showers, Harbor Breton uh, by 4 o'clock so it's really the evening hours when this is really going to intensify but we will we will be getting rain throughout the day so tomorrow during the daytime before this is all said and done we'll have 10 to 20 millimeters of rain on the Avalon Peninsula 30 to 40 millimeters of rain for the Bonavista area and Terra Nova and along the south coast the Buren Peninsula Harbor Breton 40 to 50 millimeters of rain tomorrow. So that's before it's all said and done. There is still more rain coming. And of course, Labrador, pretty quiet day tomorrow. You're not getting any of this, uh, but temperatures quite nice. Chance of showers there in uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay. So throughout the day then, Thursday evening, uh, this is continuing and actually intensifying even more. We'll be seeing those higher winds in the nighttime. Here we are at 9 o'clock, and uh, that rain is really coming down there on the Avalon as well. Continuing on uh, early Friday morning, here we are at midnight and that storm is still plugging away uh, in the northern parts of the island there. So by the time it's all said and done, these are your totals. We have 20 to 40 millimeters for the eastern portion of the Avalon and for this area here, 40 to 70 millimeters of rain by the time this storm finally moves off. And as for the winds throughout the day tomorrow, you'll notice that it, it won't be too windy, but as we get into the evening hours, that's when this is really going to ramp up. You can see the gusts here, 75, 55 in St. John's. That's really going to ramp up throughout the evening hours. So yeah, it's going to be a, tomorrow will be pretty wet, uh, but tomorrow night is when we're really going to see the action. I'll have a look at your weekend weather forecast coming up a bit later. Debbie. Thanks, Carolyn. Well, many young Newfoundland couples dream of owning their own home. Jess Puddister and Tim Ward are no different. But what is different is their dream home is tiny. So tiny, the town of Pooch Cove, where the couple wants to live, doesn't quite know how to deal with their application. 
It's not everyone's dream home, but this unfinished tiny home is Jess and Tim's. She's a geologist, he's a welder, and they started building their home in 2015. But for now, it's on a piece of land in Baleen, while the couple tries to get approval to move it to Pooch Cove. It's just 360 square feet, and that's less than half the minimum size allowed under the town's regulations. So Jess and Tim, just show us what you've got done and what is still left to do. Right. Um, so as you can see, Debbie, all of the, uh, the framing is done. The exterior shell is all finished. We finished doing the clapboard siding last weekend, actually. Uh -huh. And we've got all the windows in, the roof is on, and the next step is to move into the interior work. So we're going to be doing the, the rough in for electrical and plumbing next. All right, so as you can see, Debbie, uh, we haven't touched the inside yet. Um, that'll be the next step. But once we do come in here, um, up here is going to be our main loft where we'll have our bedroom. And then over here is a guest loft, so we'll have space for people to visit. And there'll be a sectional couch over here with an entertainment system. Mm -hmm. And then on this side of the wall, there'll be 10 feet of counter space with a stove and a sink and our fridge on the other side and a bathroom at the back of the house. So Jess and Tim, what is the appeal of a tiny home? Well, I think for us, um, the big thing that jumped out to us when we sort of hatched the idea was the freedom that it would afford us um, in all things. Uh, so, you know, only spending a small amount of money on our house and the materials that we need to build it, it would allow us to take some of our disposable income and spend it on travel and spend it on entrepreneurship. Yeah. yeah. So, Tim, it's a, it's a lifestyle choice and economics as well. Mm, it certainly has to suit your lifestyle. It's not for everyone, but... I spend, we like to spend most of our time outside and in the workshop and out at things. You pretty well only come to your house to sleep and shower and eat. <laughs> so what's this going to cost you in the end? So materials wise, it's, it's in the ballpark of 30000 And then when you factor in labor, um, which we've done ourselves, that'll take it up to around 75000 And then with the cost of land and well and septic, um, total will be around 125000 Hmm. Yeah. So you're not going to be harnessed with a 25-year mortgage then, are you? No, definitely not. <laughs> no. We'll be able to pay it off in at least four or five years. A lot of people uh, might look at this and think, there's not a whole lot of personal space here. <laughs> How are you guys not going to kill each other? <laughs> this is a very valid question. Um, we've, we have had some practice, actually. We lived in Japan for um, over a year, and our apartment in Japan was half the size of what our tiny house is. Wow. So we got very good at communication. Um, and building the house itself was also, you know, as a couple building a house together, that's a big test for a relationship, and we're doing really well. <laughs> uh, and I understand you want a family. How are you going to manage that, Tim? Uh, I think it's doable, uh, up to a certain point. When it steps into a teenager range, it might be a little bit trickier, but with uh, smaller kids, you could definitely do it. Yeah, and I definitely want our kids just to have more of an outdoor lifestyle as well, spending more time playing outdoors. Yeah. Has anybody expressed any concerns to you about building a house like this? Um, does it uh, perhaps present um, a devaluing of somebody else's property? You know, I've, I've heard that concept brought up before um, by, you know, various council members in different towns, but I think it's more, um, you know... It's a bit of a myth. Yeah, uh, I really do think it is, because if you're, if you're looking at doing, um, you know, appraisal on a, on a, on a house, it's, you're going to look at other houses of similar value, not what's a couple doors down. So we have neighborhoods in St. John's now where we have houses that are worth half a million dollars, and a few doors down, maybe there's a $300,000 house or $200,000 house with two apartments in it, and no one really bats an eye. So with all these big houses that are around, there's no stigma about having a tiny house. From the response we've gotten from the public and online, we you know we have a blog and we have a Facebook group about it. The the support has been overwhelming. We've anyone, had nothing but positivity. Anyone that's seen it or has been around it has thought, "Wow, this is like this is beautiful. Like, why would anyone have a problem with this?" Yeah, it's friends and family are supportive. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. our yeah. parents have been really supportive and from day one, really, because they just you know we're being independent and taking our future into our own hands. This is catching on certainly in in other parts of North America. 
America, you can go online and see even shows about how to build tiny houses. Stephenville is on board now with the development of 13. What do you think? Is it going to catch on out here? Absolutely. For yeah. Sure. I think there's a big demand for tiny houses and I think that, you know, the people of Newfoundland deserve to have options when it comes to sustainable and affordable housing and this is one of those options. With Muskrat Falls coming online and power rates going up, a lot of people are looking at this and being like, yeah, that's that's what we're going to have to do. That's the, that's the next big thing. That's the way forward. Yeah, yeah that's definitely the way forward. And the Makes way sense. forward for you guys, you hope is sooner than later, you want to get things going and get settled in somewhere. Yeah, that's right. We want to get living in our tiny house before winter so we can settle in. <laughs> yeah. Well, best of luck to you, Jess and Tim. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, the crowds are starting to gather here on George Street as the new summer concert series kicks off tonight. I'm Jeremy Eaton. I'm still on the street, and I'll tell you more about what's going to happen tonight coming up. Well, it's a place better known for bars, beers, and big parties, but tonight a new party will hit George Street, and this one is focused on getting an all-ages audience on the downtown strip. The George Street Summer Concert Series starts tonight with Carolina East and Dennis Parker. Here now is Jeremy Eaton has been getting ready to take in the show. Jeremy, how are things going right now? Well, uh, a bunch of people are starting to come in, uh, some young families as well to take in the free shows. And you can see Dennis Parker's on the stage, so he's going to hit there at 7 p.m. At 8 p.m., the Carolina East Band, she's an EC-nominated singer, she's going to take the stage as well. So the hope is, is that this summer series will open up George Street to a new audience, a younger audience with these all ages shows. So this will happen every Wednesday throughout the summer until September the 12th, with the exception of the 25th and obviously we're got a day on August 1st. Now, lots of people, so lots of people are starting to gather and, and mull about to take this all in. So the hope is, is that the series will open up the street to a new younger audience so people can check it out. Now work is already underway to change the image down here. Uh, Yoga on George has become increasingly popular and that's in its third year. So maybe, just maybe the world's most popular party street is getting ready to grow up. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Jeremy Eaton in St. John's. Yeah. <laughs>
Okay, that's just beginning. <laughs> In the summer of 1985, Tina Turner was singing Newfoundland's praises. That's because the legendary singer kicked off her North American tour right here in St. John's. Turner was looking for a quiet spot to perform, so we dipped into the Here and Now vault back more than 30 years to bring you this report from Marie Wadden. I have a view from my window. It, it looks like the neck going out to the sea. That is very soothing to, to wake up in the morning to have my coffee too. And, and then it feels like a town where you just get out and walk if you want. You know, just, just Tina Turner is spending a week in St. John's to start her North American tour, and she likes it here. And the quiet is like very uh, uh, sort of a sort of meditating state of feel of it. The stopping is really very good for me. And St. John's is happy to have Tina Turner here. Because of its isolation and small population, Newfoundland is often overlooked by touring stars like her, who go to other major Canadian cities as a matter of course. But now, being out of the mainstream might just be an advantage. Donald K. Donald is a Canadian promoter of the Turner Tour. He suggested St. John's as a place to prepare for the North American shows. It's away from New York, it's away from the media hype, it's away from the big blitz of... Uh, and it keeps them out of the way and on the go. We needed a quiet place. Uh, the musicians can get sort of uh, sidetracked. <laughs> <laughs> it was good to get out of it LA. It was good to get out of LA or out of New York. We needed a quiet place. And what could be more innocent than a ball game for the roadies and musicians on Turner's tour? They've been cooling their heels in St. John's between rehearsals, thrilling locals with sightings of them at city bars and restaurants. The musicians really love it here. And we plan to sort of hit a few of the little night spots before we go. Out in the ruins. Out from the Well, here's something to tell you about. This young black bear is actively feeding on the side of the highway in Grossmore National Park. It's the second year this bear has been spotted grazing on a grass buffet roadside. Now, Parks Canada officials warn the public not to feed the animal. And even though it's very cute, don't get too close because it is a wild animal. The park's wardens say it's also not safe to stop on the twisty turning road in Grossmore. So stay with us, mind the advice there, and stay with us. Carolyn is going to be back after the break with the weekend forecast.
Now to meet a couple of young athletes of the day, this is seven-year-old Landon Bishop of Grand Falls, Windsor. Excuse me, he plays in the novice division for hockey. He also uh, does the power skating program, ball hockey, basketball, and baseball in the summer. Congratulations, Landon. Our second young athlete of the day, Blake Ward from Labrador City. Blake is a goaltender on the Black Panthers for the Labrador West Minor Hockey Association. Congratulations, Blake. Time now for a look at the long range forecast, but of course it's all Chris all the time. So quick recap of what we can expect over the next 24 hours. Hurricane Chris is headed our way, expected to uh, bring us uh, some showers starting tomorrow morning, but really intensify in the afternoon late into the evening. So once again, we do have the rainfall warning in effect for uh, the Conegra up through Bonavista and down the Buren Peninsula and parts of the Avalon Peninsula, 40 to 70 millimeters of rain expected with this storm by the time it's all said and done 20 to 40 millimeters of rain for the eastern portion of the Avalon and those high winds as well with the wind warning in effect uh, for tomorrow evening. So throughout the day it will be pretty rainy. Uh, lots of rain throughout uh, the Marystown area and up through Bonavista 40 to 50 millimeters throughout the day there. Temperatures fairly warm uh, just below the 20 mark and uh, corner below Corner Brook looking at a nice day tomorrow with mainly cloudy skies and a chance of showers there in Labrador for tomorrow. So Thursday evening, this is when uh, things really ramp up with the storm. Uh, we get those higher winds and those heavier rainfalls uh, coming through. But by Friday morning, things are starting to settle once again. And then we're in for quite a nice start to the weekend for everyone. Just look at this, a mix of sun and cloud for the entire island. Temperatures uh, 19 in San St. John's 26 in Central, 23 on the West Coast, and Labrador looking great. 31 degrees in Eastern Labrador on Friday. So a great start to the weekend. Saturday, we are looking at some showers coming through the western portion of Labrador, but really nice on the island. So Saturday is definitely looking like the better of the two days on the weekend to get out and do something. We're looking at temperatures in the low to mid 20s on the island with a mix of sun and cloud. 28 degrees in eastern Labrador on uh, Saturday, 21 with those chance of showers uh, in western Labrador on Saturday. Now Sunday, we are looking at some rain moving in uh, in the eastern portion of the island for St. John's, but temperatures staying warm uh, Sunday into Monday. Some overcast skies as you begin the work week. A similar story there for central Newfoundland. Going to be a bit of a showery Sunday and a cloudy Monday with those warm temperatures once again bumping up to 27 degrees on Monday. And western Newfoundland already also looking at uh, a showery Sunday and a decent Monday for last. Labrador, some great temperatures. What a great weekend there for Eastern Labrador. 28, 29 degrees and not a bad start to the work week at 31 degrees with a mix of sun and cloud. And for Western Labrador, a nice Sunday shaping up there with some showers moving in on Monday. And have a look at this. This is our beautiful viewer photo of the day. Uh, when we come back, I'll let you know where this was taken.
And here's our beautiful viewer photo of the day. Isn't this lovely? Beautiful. Nice sunset. It is beautiful. They're all gorgeous. They really are. And this one was taken in Red Indian Lake. So right in the uh, center of the island. Yeah, Tony Walsh sent that in to uh, nlphotos at cbc.ca. So thank you very much for that. So it's uh, going to be a nice uh, night in our area for the concert series downtown, but uh, you have some advice for travelers tomorrow? Yes, I saw uh, Air Canada is advising travelers to check uh, your uh, flights. Uh, if you need to change it tomorrow night into Friday morning, then uh, you can do that free of charge. So Good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks.